start out the worship service by reading a scripture from 2 Kings about the prophet Elisha. See the message to us today from the prophet Elisha, who was a prophet to the children of Israel in about 800 BC. When the servant of the man of God, that's the servant of Elisha, got up, he went out early in the morning and he looked outside and saw an army with horses and chariots surrounding the whole city. Oh my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha then prayed. And this is just a wonderful prayer. Oh, Lord, open the eyes of my servant so that he may see. Then the Lord opened that servant's eyes. He looked up in the hills. He saw horses and chariots of fire all around him from the Lord, absolutely overwhelming the enemy. And I pray that this morning, when you get up this morning and you see the beautiful flowers and you see the mist in the trees and you see our church and all the things that are happening, I, I pray this morning that the Lord will open up your eyes so you can see God all around you like the servant of Elisha. Thanks be to God for that. Well, I'm Paul Ebel. I'm pulpit assistant today. And I'm tickled to introduce you initially to Dr. Phyllis Sanders who's sitting right here. She's going to be our minister for the day. Jason is on vacation, and uh, <clears throat> Dr. Sanders is our presbytery um, leader for the vital congregations movement that we have in our presbytery. And as you know, Jason's deeply involved in that, so she's sort of Jason's mentor. And so when Jason went on vacation, there was just no question about who we were gonna ask to come and, and preach on the Sunday that he's missing. So we're just thrilled to have Dr. Sanders with us today. Also, Lisa is in the audience also from the Presbytery, and she's sitting right down here, and many of you may have met Lisa also. She's the administration person in the, secretary, in, uh, the Presbytery. So we're glad to have both of you here, and we, if we have other visitors in the audience, we're thrilled to have you here also. Be sure and and tell us at the, the ushers or me or anybody who you are as you're leaving and know that we're glad that you're here even though we've got you all sitting six feet apart. That's just too bad. I have one other announcement to make. There are a bunch of announcements in the bulletin, but I do want you to be aware that our youth next Saturday are having a clothing drive for Acts. So it's going to be the kind of clothing drive you drive up, open your trunk, and the kids will take your clothes out of your trunk and take them to act. So dig through your closet, have a spring cleaning there, and then bring those clothes here next Saturday for the closing, for our Axe clothing drive. So we always have our announcements first. Uh, are there any other announcements we have to make? Well, then let us worship God. Please rise, if you're able, for our call to worship. 
Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. He loves righteousness and justice. All the earth is full of steadfast love of the Lord. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. Just open up your eyes and see it. You may be seated. <clears throat> this is the time in the worship service where we have our prayer of confession. We are all sinners. Anyone who thinks they are not a sinner is just deceiving themselves and deceiving God. 
So let us at the start of this worship service confess our sins. And at the end of this brief prayer, there'll be a time where you can, silent time, where you can silently confess your personal sins to God. So join me in this prayer of confession. Gracious God, we confess your teaching is obvious, but we often miss it, even when it is in front of us. We see your authority and power, yet hesitate to submit ourselves to your will fully. Forgive us, O God. Help us through your spirit to humbly ourselves before your presence and receive your teaching for life through Jesus Christ. Having confessed our sins, all God's children said, Amen. So who's in a position to condemn us for these sins that we just confessed? For having this obvious teaching in front of us and us missing it, even though it's right in front of our face. Well, it's Jesus Christ. And Christ died for our sins, rose again for our sins, sits on the right hand of God and argues our case every single day. In Jesus Christ, we are redeemed. As you hear this water poured into the font, I want you to remember that God claims us all in baptism through faith. So let's walk by the spirit of the living God. Please rise if you're able for the hymn. You may be seated. At this time in both worship services, we pass the peace. We can't do it in the way we normally do it, but we can do it by just looking around at other people and respond to them as you respond to me. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another and seek reconciliation. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So with you, the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And now it's time for the children's moment with Michelle Lorio. Good morning. Happy, hmm, happy regular Sunday. <laughs> There's a lot of excitement and a lot of buildup when we're getting ready for Easter. The music is amazing. The sermon is filled with hope and joy and love. We even had an Easter egg hunt. So the church builds up and gets us super excited, but 
Now what? As soon as Easter's over, it's back to business as usual. Normal services, normal Sunday school, normal activities. Do you think it was back to business as usual for the disciples after Easter? What happened on Monday? It's kind of interesting to sort of think. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, were they searching for him? Were they looking for him? What was going on in their lives and in their homes in the days after? Were they hopeful or were they disappointed? I don't know exactly what they were thinking, but I do believe that Easter changed the followers of Jesus. Even on regular back-to-normal days, they knew that Jesus was alive again, and they could never go back to the way it had been before they met Jesus. The same is true for us. Even on a normal day, it's amazing because we know the truth. We know that Jesus is alive. So where is he now? Now that we know he's alive, is he here in church? We come here to uh, celebrate God and to worship together, but can you think of somewhere else that God lives? God lives here in this building with us, but he also dwells in each one of us. The Bible tells us that each one of us is a temple of God, a place where God dwells. If you're willing and welcome God into your heart, God is more than willing to enter your life and go with you wherever you go. But what happens when you mess up? I've messed up a couple times since I woke up this morning. Does that mean he doesn't dwell in me any longer? Of course not. God loves me. He loves all of you just exactly as we are. And we're forgiven and loved not because we don't make mistakes. We're forgiven through God's grace. No sin is too great that it can keep us from God. He's always there, and when we ask for forgiveness, he, he is invited to return back, and we can go to our loving God once again. We are all sinners, but more importantly, we are all beloved children of God. So the good news is that God gave his son to be our savior. Jesus died on the cross to take our punishment for our sins, but Jesus did not stay dead. He rose again to be our living Savior. So you are a temple of God, a place where God lives. Wherever you go and whatever happens, always remember that God is with you. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for Jesus who died and rose again to be our living Savior. Amen.
guide us, O God, by your word and spirit. Open our minds that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may be led into your truth and taught your will and that in your light we may see the light. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from Isaiah, chapter 25, verses 6 through 9, from the New Living Translation. And it reads, In Jerusalem, the Lord of heaven's armies will spread a wonderful feast for all the people of the world. It would be a delicious banquet with clear, well-aged wine and choice meat. There, he will remove the cloud of gloom, the shadow of death that hangs over the earth. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away all tears. He will remove forever all insults and mockery against his land and people. The Lord has spoken. In that day, the people will proclaim, this is our God. We trust in him, and he saved us. This is the Lord in whom we trusted. Let us rejoice in the salvation he brings. Our New Testament reading comes from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22, from the English Standard Version. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you will also you are also built together into a dwelling place by God, by the Spirit. Hear what the Spirit says to the church. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Last Sunday, we celebrated Easter and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as we declared he is risen. So this Sunday, let us begin our worship service by offering a word of praise to God our Father. So will you join me in just saying hallelujah? Can you say that with me? Hallelujah. Yes, hallelujah. What a way to begin our worship service because hallelujah is defined as, a, as the utterance of God to be praised in worship. And it's said to be the highest forms of praise one can express. I'm so thankful, as I know you are, that Christ is our risen Savior. I'm so thankful that God placed me here with you this morning. But I want you to know, and Paul has already told you, I didn't come alone. I have a traveling partner, Lisa Mallory, my coworker, but most of all, my friend, so I thank Lisa for traveling with me this morning to this beautiful sanctuary. My topic today is from the cross to the church. Now, I will confess that this topic is not original. Initially, my topic was from resurrection to revitalization. But as I was praying early Monday morning, last Monday morning, the Spirit so clearly, with audacity and power, whispered in the middle of my prayers now, from the cross to the church. And I said, mm. So I stand here this morning in obedience to the Holy Spirit with him as the originator of my sermon. So first... From the cross to the church is a powerful move in the life of a Christian. 
And I want you to know that this move from the cross is a visible sign of several things. You see, it's a sign of doom and gloom for sin, our sin. See, the cross is also a visible representation of divine help and hope for sinners. So we heard the words of Isaiah saying that the Lord would remove clouds of gloom, and that is what the cross does for us. Our greatest help and hope lie in the power of our salvation. Now see, for me, that's a hallelujah praise. It's a hallelujah praise because we are cleansed and our sins are forgiven, as we have already heard this morning. Now, this is one thought that we can reflect upon when we look at the cross in this church, a beautiful cross. And then we should follow Isaiah's direction by rejoicing in the salvation that Jesus brings. Now, it's also important for us to remember when we look at the cross, this is where the salvation that we rejoiced in started. See, we can't make this move from the cross to the church without remembering what it cost our Lord. Maybe that's why the Holy Spirit had me to change my topic. Although we can and should rejoice in our salvation, we cannot fully appreciate the move without remembering the cross and the sacrifice that allows us to make this powerful move to resurrection and revitalization in the church. Now, the second thought in reference from the cross to the church is a message, and it is a message of resurrection and revitalization. Let me share with you how closely these two words are. You see, they both have similar meaning. Rebirth, renewal, reawakening. So from the cross to the church speaks with a message about another divine purpose. The cross is a symbol, and it's a sign to help us to gain insight for a new awakening and a new birth. And this awakening and this new birth are described in Isaiah, but in Isaiah uh, 43, verse uh, 19, in two strong statements and one pointed question. Listen to these words. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? These words ring true as a part of the prophecy of Isaiah. And this scripture is actually one of the foundational scriptures for the Vital Congregations Initiative. See, the gaining of insight for renewal and reawakening is taking place right here in your midst as you envision from the cross to the church in how you are accepting the new thing that is happening and the way you are allowing the Holy Spirit to lead this congregation through this vital congregation initiative. When we accept the gift of the Holy Spirit, you see, hearts are transformed. When we accept the gift of the Holy Spirit, we are silenced when sometimes we just want to scream. The flesh becomes silent as the Holy Spirit speaks to us and through us. See, it's the Holy Spirit who allows us to examine our hearts and reflect on how we handle the crosses in our own lives. Then we enter the church and we see the cross of Jesus Christ and humility steps in and fills our hearts with more love for God, more love for ourselves, and more love for other people. See, through the power of the Holy Spirit, not only are believers saved, healed, sealed, and sanctified, 
the Holy Spirit reveals God's thoughts, teaches and guides believers into all truths. You know, I'm reminded of a conversation that I had with your pastor as I was getting to know him. And he shared with me some professional and spiritual development activities in which he had been involved. Now, what I have come to realize from that conversation, maybe last year or the year before, is that the Holy Spirit was preparing your pastor to come to this church long before he was called, though he did not know it. See, Jason was led to engage in transformational leadership studies before he knew anything about vital congregations and before he knew anything about you. The Holy Spirit was preparing him while at the same time planting the seed of revitalization in some of your hearts and minds because you see the Vital Congregation Initiative had just come to Trinity Presbytery and some of you were interested but you did not have a pastor. When God did send you a pastor, some of you and even some of our other pastors in our presbytery in deepest concern for your pastor thought that the initiative just may be too much for a new pastor. But God, but Jesus, but the Holy Spirit took you from then of yesterday to the now of today and just look at how you are moving. See, we're not always aware of the movement of the Holy Spirit going from one place to another, nor from one person to another. We just need to give attention to the message. So from the movement to the message takes us to the third thought to consider from the cross to the church. And that is motivation to keep ch the church active and moving forward by the help of the Holy Spirit in the process of revitalization. It was the Holy Spirit that motivated you to embrace the teaching and learning about the seven marks of a vital congregation lifelong discipleship formation, intentional, authentic evangelism, outward incarnational focus, empower servant leadership, spirit-inspired worship, caring relationships, and ecclesia health. See, the Holy Spirit is likely now to take you out of your comfort zone and give you a deeper desire to reach out to the homeless, reach out to people who may not look like you, have cars like you, eat like you, or even smell like you. Yet the cross represents suffering and their need for church people to extend a helping hand. After all, the Great Commission is to go out and make disciples and it cannot be done from the pews. This type of revitalization does require training and retraining and equipping leaders for the new thing that are new things that are springing forth. Do you not perceive it? You see, I believe if you can perceive it, I believe you can achieve it. And your session is to be commended for their action to approve for this church to move forward with vital congregations. The Christian Education Committee and all other groups in the church who are working to achieve all these new things God is sending your way, be encouraged and continue your good works. In revitalization, everyone has something to contribute. Now, with what you have already accomplished this year, a year of unprecedented times filled with both challenges and changes, yet 
your work has been taken to the national level in the Presbyterian denomination as one of the models for beginning to revitalize. And I've called on your pastor to share your revitalization work with Presbyterians across this country. Dr. Murphy and I have used your work and shared your spirit for your revitalization with other Presbyterians who are trying to learn how to begin to revitalize as they call on Trinity Presbytery to help them out. And we call on our pastors to share their thoughts, their feelings, their bumps, and even thumps of resistance only to help others along the way. We know, we know that it's not likely that everyone will be cheerleaders of revitalization. But if you keep your eyes on the cross, people will begin to see the light and those burdens of resistance will roll away. It is there by faith that everyone will eventually receive their sight and revitalization and resurrection will bring happiness all the day, but in Jesus' way. So remember this. Just think about this. People could not conceive that Jesus would rise on the third day, but he did. People's lack of vision, imagination, and faith did not stop him from rising. There was disagreement around the cross, and you will encounter disagreement. We, as true believers, must handle disagreement in the fruit of the Spirit, love, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. See, disagreements can lead to growth when all points of view are expressed and the sweet fruit is spoken in the dwelling place of the Lord. Christ expects us to handle disagreements with the fruit of the Spirit. Why? Because against such things there is no law. And when we conduct our meetings with the fruit of the Spirit, we join together and we grow together. Now, I like the way Paul pins the words in Ephesians. He says this, we are no longer strangers and aliens, but we are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows, grows in a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So South Aiken, Keep your eyes on the cross because that's where you will find the symbol of salvation. Keep your mind on Christ. That is where you will gain the strength for revitalization. And keep your ears open to the Holy Spirit. That is where you will find your motivation to keep South Aiken Presbyterian Church vigilant, vigorous, vital, and victorious for all people who walk in that door, for all people who come in here to worship in spirit and in truth. And when all is saying, said and done, we all can sing, victory is mine. Amen and amen. May we stand and please join in the hymn, Victory is Mine.
our response to God's word is answering the question, Christians, what do you believe? And we use the Apostles' Creed, written in about 200 A.D. and revised up till about 800 A.D. by the Christians throughout all those centuries as they were refining to make sure this answer was just right. So join me in the question, answering the question, Christians of South Aiken, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, <clears throat> and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. At this point in the worship service, we have a prayer of intercession. And in this prayer of intercession, we, we start out with a prayer, and then we remember the people in our congregation and around the world that particularly need their eyes opened so they can see God all around them. So join me in this prayer of intercession, and then we'll remember these people in our congregation and around the world that need your comfort. Join me, please, in a prayer of intercession. God of mercy, you have promised to hear what we ask in the name of Christ. Accept and fulfill our petitions, we pray, not as we ask in our ignorance, nor as we deserve in our sinfulness, but as you know and love us in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And Heavenly Father, in particular, we ask you today to remember those in our congregation who need your touch. Remember the families of Bill and Archie. Remember Jim and Shirley, Emma, Bob Baker, David Ice, all the people that are listed in our bulletin, these people and others, our Heavenly Father, need to have your guidance, your help to open their eyes, see the hills around them covered with God's holy angels with his chariots, chariots looking after us all. All of this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> At, this is the time in the worship service usually where we accept our offerings. Uh, we, we're doing this online. We do it remotely. We also do it in the church office. So we ask you folks that are watching us on the video and those that are here to please give your time, your talent, to, and your money to this church so that we can do our worship and our, our work here in this community. It's a time for our prayer of thanksgiving and the Lord's Prayer. This is a prayer where we come to God and we just say, thank you, God, for all the things you've done for us. And at the very end of it, we'll say the Lord's Prayer. So join me in the prayer of thanksgiving and then the Lord's Prayer. God of all mercies, we give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all people. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your boundless love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, by the means of grace and for the hope of glory. Give us 
each an awareness of your mercies. Let us see those mercies on the hills all around us that you've given to us. And then with truly thankful hearts, may we show forth your praise, not only with our lives and our lips, but the way we respond to you. And our Heavenly Father, you taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please rise. As you leave this church, I charge you to go out into the world and share the ministry of Jesus Christ. I charge you to keep your eyes on the cross as you go into the community to love and serve God's people, your siblings in Christ. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.